Hey guys, I'm Dave Troll and welcome to the Troll Gallery. Today, we're going to build a raised panel door. A client recently asked me to build a cabinet for them to match the rest of their kitchen. And while the box or the cabinet went together fairly easily, I hadn't built a raised panel door in years. Since I had just upgraded my router table, it seemed like the perfect time to show you how I did it. And yes, you do need a router table to build a door this way. The bits are too large and unwieldy to use any other way. Let's take a look and see how it came together. Like most of my projects, I started the miter saw, cross-cutting my pieces to their rough length. In this case, I'm making one door, so I need two styles, the vertical pieces, and two rails, the horizontal pieces. I'll tackle the panel stock later. The stock I had was thicker than I needed and a little wonky. And since I don't have a jointer, yet, I used a bit of hot glue and secured the boards to a known flat surface of MDF. I can now run the stock through the planer until one face was flat and parallel to the MDF. I could then pull the stock off the MDF, clean off the majority of the hot glue, and mark the face opposite the now flat face with pencil. With the flat face down, I could plane the other face parallel to the first. Once both faces were clean, and I could tell because the pencil lines were removed, I could take a bit off of both sides until I got close to my desired thickness, in this case 3 quarters of an inch. I switched the feed rate on my planer to finishing and took one last pass on each side, leaving a clean surface and two boards at the correct thickness. Again, since I don't currently have a jointer, I put my stock in a straight line jig and ripped one edge straight. I got the plans for this jig from Fisher Shop and I'll leave a link for that below. Once I had one of the edges straight and 90 degrees to the face, I could remove the straight line jig, adjust my fence, and cut my stock to width. Well, just over my final width. In this case, about 2 and 5 sixteenths. This step may make a few people cringe, but I took my stock back to the planer and cleaned up the saw marks on the edges with a few light passes and brought them to their final width of 2 and a quarter inches. This has rarely caused an issue for me and it saves a ton of sanding. To determine the length of the styles and rails, I began with the opening for my cabinet. In this case, 27 and a half inches by 12 and 3 quarters. To match the existing cabinets, I needed a 3 quarter inch overlay on all sides. So that meant the final dimensions of my door were going to be 29 inches by 14 and a quarter. The styles are easy. They match the height of the opening, or 29 inches. Although I like to leave them long for now, closer to, say, 31 inches. The rails take a little math, however. To find that length, start with the width of the door, 14 and a quarter inches from my door, less the width of the two styles, or two times two and a quarter inches. Add the length of the two tenons from your rail cutter, again, in my case, two times three eighths of an inch, and that gives us a final dimension of 10 and a half inches. It's time to start shaping the parts. I like to start with the rail ends as any blowout while cutting end grain will be hidden later. I built a sled to help with this step. It not only provides a wide area to ride against my router fence, but it also backs the rails during the cuts to minimize any blowout. And these are fairly large bits, so I cut my speed down to half don't try and swing a bit that big at full speed. Also, don't be afraid to use lots of scrap wood and take several test cuts to get your bit height just right. I've had my style and rail cutter for years and it didn't come with any setup blocks. 
but I made a set so that anytime I want to recreate this joint, I can use the setup block to get me close to my final cut height. Once you have the bit set and your fence in place, simply put a rail against the fence of the sled, hold it in place with the toggle clamp, and make your pass. Flip the stock end for end, keeping the same face down and route the other end. Once you've routed all of the end grain of your rail stock, you can switch out the router bit for its mate, the style cutter, which is really a misnomer since both styles and rails get cut with this bit. You can use a setup block or one of the rails you just cut to set the bit height. Now you can adjust your router fence to be in line with the bearing on the bit, but please do some test cuts before you commit to your real stock. When your style test cut lines up with your rail cuts, you can route the inside face of each style and rail. You should be able to do these cuts in one pass, should being the operative word here. I hadn't used this set in several years and the style cutter must have been dull or I had some really twisty grain in my last style, and it got chewed up. I had an extra piece of stock milled, and not wanting to risk any more excitement, I adjusted my fence and took three passes to get the full depth on that last piece. Guess it's time to find a good sharpening service. Now it's time to start on that panel. Milling goes pretty much the same way to start. Rough cut it to length, Plane one face straight, plane the other face parallel, rip one edge straight, and then rip enough stock down a width. Before gluing up the panel of multiple pieces, it's often a good idea to have the growth rings of adjoining pieces going in opposite directions. I've added pencil lines here to help show the direction. This keeps the panel more stable over time and while I may choose grain pattern over equilibrium, it's still a good practice to use to ensure your panels stay flat for years to come. With the panel layout set, it's time for a little glue and clamps. Too much glue can mean a lot of cleanup later. Not enough and you'll have a starved joint. Just right will do. I always alternate my clamps when assembling a panel. One up, one down, etc. Again, this equalizes the pressure and ensures nothing moves during the clamping process. On closed grade and woods, like maple, you can wipe off the excess glue right away with a damp cloth. On open grain woods, like oak, I'll let the glue sit up for about an hour and scrape it off. That prevents the excess glue from being forced into the wood pores and may show up later during finishing. Once the glue has had time to set for a few hours, or preferably overnight, you can remove the clamps, scrape off any excess glue, and then plane your panel to its final thickness. That thickness could be a full 3 quarter inch if you're going to use a back cutter on your panel, but generally shoot for 5 8 inch as I am here. Once at the proper thickness, you can go back to your table saw and cut the panel to width and length. The width will be the same width as your rail pieces, but there's a little more math to figure out the length. Here we'll start with the height of your door, which in my case is 29 inches. Subtract the width of the two rails, or two times two and a quarter inches, plus the depth of the panel groove, again in my case two times three eighths of an inch, for a final dimension of twenty-five and a quarter inches long. If you thought the style and rail cutters were fairly large, let's talk about a horizontal panel raising bit. Most are about four inches in diameter. That's a big chunk of steel. Before you even mount it in your router, adjust the speed to the slowest possible speed you have. Don't even think about using these guys in a single speed router. A single speed router spins at about 24,000 RPM. These bits should be used at something way closer to 12,000 RPM. Okay, now that we have the speed thing under control, will your bit fit in your table? And yes, you have to use all these bits in a table. Style and rail cutters and panel bits. In my case, my bit is larger than the opening in my router plate. 
so I made an auxiliary table from quarter inch plywood to help bury part of the bit. I'd have preferred a half inch lift, but I got by with a quarter of an inch because, well, that's what I had on hand. I trimmed out a space for the router bit with my jigsaw, added some tracks for the fence mounting hardware, and a hole so I could adjust my router height from above. There are two ways to raise a panel like this. You can either set your fence in line with the bearing on the bit and take several light passes, raising the bit after each pass, or you can set the bit to its final height and move the fence back after each pass. While I prefer the former, in this case I did a bit of both since I couldn't lower the bit as low as I would have liked. The point is to take several light passes to remove all the stock to get you to your final profile. I generally take four or five passes, with the last pass being a very light cut to ensure a smooth finish. The goal here is to get the full profile of your cutter while the top of the panel ends up being in the same plane as the top of your styles and rails. Once your panel fits nicely into the style and rails, it's a good time to clean it up. I like to do all my sanding of the panel before assembly. I sand the face and the back at 120 grit with a random orbit sander, and then I clean up the profile. You can use blocks of wood or shape sanding blocks to match your profiles. Once you've cleaned up the profile through 220 grit, I like to go back and clean up the large faces with 150 and 220 grit sandpaper on my random orbit sander. By the same token, it's easier to clean up the inside profiles of the styles and rails now. I use a shaped rubber sanding block, and I think they're called tadpoles, but I've had these guys for decades. I went again with 120 grit and 220 grit sandpaper sanding them by hand. Cleaning these now rather than later will save you a massive headache. With all of your parts cleaned up, it's time to glue up your door. I kept my styles long for now, and I marked the outer edge of my door height to let me know where to place my rails. A little glue on one end of each rail and set it in place at the line marked on the edge of your door styles. Then you can slide in the panel without any glue. And then add glue to the other end of your rails and clamp them in place with the other style. Check to make sure that your door height is correct. And then check for square by measuring your diagonals. If the door is square, the diagonal measurements will be equal. If one side is longer than the other, make a few adjustments until they match, and then tighten down your clamps. Once the glue has dried, remove your door from the clamps and scrape off any excess glue. This is a good time to do your first sanding, but I only go as far as 120 grit. I'm only trying to flatten out any discrepancies between the styles and rails. With the door smooth, you can take it over to your table saw and cut off the excess style tails with a crosscut slid. A little more sanding to clean up the edges, and it's time to work on the edge profile. If you're adding one, that is. I was matching this door to an existing kitchen, so I started with a bit that gave me a cove cut on the edges. Again, I took my time and made several test cuts before I got the bit and fence just where I wanted it. I switched over to a roundover bit and made another pass using the outer edges. And while it's not a perfect match to the original doors, after a little sanding it's pretty damn close. And speaking of sanding, Time to get out one of those cove-shaped tadpoles and a couple of different roundover tadpoles to help me clean up the router marks and get the shape I was looking for. Again, I soldered each profile with 120 grit and I finished with 220 grit. Since these doors are going to be mounted with European hinges, this was the perfect time to drill the holes for them. It's best to follow the manufacturer's directions, and in this case I just matched the existing doors that I happen to have. I measured down 3.5 inches from the ends and in 7 eighths from the edge and drilled the 35mm holes for the hinge cups. 
A fence on your drill press and a depth stop makes repeating these cuts a breeze. If you remember, I didn't glue the panels in place. That allows for seasonal movement. But it can also allow the panel to rattle. To prevent that, I set one 3 quarter inch brad at the center of the top and bottom of the panel. I make sure to shoot them at an angle so it holds the panel but it doesn't protrude through the face. With that done, I go over the door with 150 grit and then 220 grit sandpaper and my random orbit sander to clean everything up. One last step is to clean up any excess glue or little bits of wood in the corner of the styles and rails. A razor knife, exacto knife, or even a chisel works well here. Just work delicately. A heavy hand can cause more harm than good, but with practice you can end up with clean, sharp corners. And once that's done, your door is ready for the finish of your choice. A little math, some sharp bits, and some light passes are really all you need to put together a raised panel door. And even with the few setbacks that I had, in the end the door came out pretty well. If you like this video, give us a thumbs up and maybe share it with your friends. If you haven't already, maybe think about subscribing and hitting that bell so you get notified every time I put out a new video. If there's something that uh, you think I could have done better, smarter, safer, please drop it in the comments below. I'd love to hear what you have to say. For now, have a great day. Take care. We'll see you soon. A client recently asked me to build a cabinet to match the rest of the boxes in their kitchen. No, 